This time I want to tackle the last book in the Bible. Revelation. Thought to give it its full title. The Revelation of Jesus Christ. And the rest of it. This book has had more absolute rubbish written about it and spoken about it than any other in the Bible. The reason's fairly clear. It's full of vivid and dramatic word pictures and stories. And those word pictures and stories are of such a momentous apocalyptic nature that they seem to many in America and other places around the world influenced by American culture to fit with events in today's world. Because, of course, we are living in the end of times. Well, maybe we are, maybe we aren't, we don't know. Jesus tells us we don't know. And so all those people who dig at the Bible to get the date are just plain nuts. But all those nuts have muddied the waters so much that most of us can't see the book of Revelation for what it is. A message given to John to give to the churches in Asia at a time of persecution and trouble. A message which they desperately needed to hear, that Jesus is king, that Jesus rules, okay? Because of the muddied waters of the nutcases reading Revelation, I'm doing two introductions to the book of Revelation. This one on how to read the book, and then another on the contents of the book. Sorry about that, I'll try to stick to five minutes for almost all the other books of the Bible. The book calls itself the Apocalypsis of Jesus Christ, the revelation, the disclosure of hidden things. That's what Apocalypsis means. So, like parts of Daniel, it will show us glimpses behind the scenes of the world, letting us see a bit of what Christ is doing off stage. This means, paradoxically, that this book requires us to learn a bit about the setting and the people for whom John is writing. It may be even more important for such a book than for one that tells the action on stage. John is a prisoner for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, he says, in Patmos, a small rocky island in the Aegean, about 15 miles west of Ephesus, on the coast of what's now Turkey. Because the book calls itself a revelation of hidden things, it's easy for clever interpreters to convince people it's a secret to be decoded. So Hal Lindsey in the 1970s decoded Revelation and proved that the world would end in one generation from 1948, when the modern state of Israel was founded. A generation, he said, was 30 years, so 1978 was the date. When it passed, he decided that a generation is actually a hundred years, that's convenient because even if he lived to be a hundred he'd be safely dead and taken all his profits with him by 2048. No, the Bible's not a code. Its message is clear. Perspicuous, remember? God's not a trickster or a puzzler who sets us difficult intellectual problems to solve. The kind of interpretation that Hal Lindsey and others uh, indulge in we call futurist because they claim that Revelation talks exclusively or almost exclusively about the future and surprisingly or unsurprisingly it's very often our own near future. The earliest futurist readings weren't quite like that. Justin Martyr in the second century for example saw the thousand years ending with the world ending also in somewhere around a thousand or a thousand and thirty AD a thousand years after Jesus but that's long in the past for us. So now people usually think the world will be ending soon, like 1978 when Hal Lindsey published Late Great Planet Earth in 1972. Another approach to the book is called Preterist. That's the opposite. It sees the book as all set in the past, our past, around John's time. This approach to reading the book seems more true than the extreme futurist approach but quite clearly there are some things in Revelation that wouldn't have made sense to John's readers as fulfilled in their lifetime. So there is still a future element to the book. Another way of reading parts of the book is to notice the way John continually echoes the rest of the Bible and especially the prophets. He creates resonances and so suggests that history repeats itself. We might call that approach to reading the book intertextual. And then 
there's the literary or symbolic approach where we notice how John creates a kind of virtual world where the real significance of events becomes clear and things in the here and now can be seen in the light of eternity it's a bit like though different from the approach that C.S. Lewis used in writing the Narnia stories whatever approaches and for sure we'll need more than one for almost any passage from Revelation I come back to the beginning and stress that we need a strong awareness of John's setting and the people for whom he was writing the other podcast on Revelation will tell you more about that setting and the contents of the book look out for it bye <laughs>